Mill Surf Garage. Okay, so this is that shotgun, I promise you. That was like a follow-up to the Remington Model 11, which was basically the A5. And uh, I know you're saying you must be making a mistake because that's an 1100 on the table. But this is not an 1100. This is pre-1100. Um, I'm pretty sure. I don't even think the 1100 was out yet. These were made from 49 to 68. But there is a little star next to that because... This is a 1973. This dates to March of 73. So, obviously there was something going on. We'll get into that. But let's, uh, let's discuss what this thing actually is. It's um, a Remington 1148. Um, but it is actually called a Mohawk 48. But just for, for all extensive purposes right now, just so we don't get confused, if you're looking it up or you're trying to find it in some book of yours or whatever, it's an 1148. The Mohawk designation was for, like, these Walmart kind of things, like for, uh, you know, how they would have these special guns that they would make for, call them big box uh, guns, um, that were for especially made for stores and stuff like that, for special stores. Um... But we'll get into that later. Let's discuss exactly what this thing is. Um, after the war, Remington, they went into this mode where they were coming, they were promising in their ads and everything that they were coming out with this new generation of semi-automatics. You know, and this was all part of that, a new design. And um, they made these things in 12, 16, 20, and 28, and even 410 uh, gauge variations. So they went right across the gambit. Uh, they held four rounds in the tube, one in the chamber, semi-automatic operated. Um, the action is kind of odd. You look at it right away and you, it looks like the 1100 where it would have a gas, uh, gas operated action, but, but it doesn't, it's carries the action over from the A5 and I'm going to show you, it's pretty crazy, but, uh, you know, Browning didn't necessarily need that hump back there evidently because this thing is smooth and sleek. You know what I mean? None of that big, that big boxy receiver. Not necessary. Um, it was actually redesigned to work this way, but obviously they're just taking Remington's design and redesigning. Uh, this is pretty cool. The guy that actually designed this thing, his name was John Vassos. This was an interesting dude. This guy was. You could know him from several different things, depending on what you're into or where your interests lie or what part of history you know. If you were into, like, electronics and things like that, you would know this guy's name because he was an RCA designer. He was, like, the top designer at RCA. And so many things are credited to this guy. Like, he designed... There there was, like, broadcast equipment that this guy engineered and invented. Like, you know, huge advances in broadcasting and television uh, mass like he i think he's credited with with uh the the, the first mass produced television design that premiered at the uh, 1939 world's fair right and uh so he into he all into communications equipment radios broadcast equipment tvs but on and but also on top of that the guy was a decorated uh world war ii vet who was uh, the the head guy of the OSS spy school, okay, so, or of one of them, there's a bunch of them, but he was the head of one of them for years, you know what I mean, so, this guy's, uh, this guy's credentials for both for military stuff and for designing were solid, you couldn't be like, you know, you first you hear the name and you're like, John Vassos, who, who the hell is that to step in and, uh, you know, think that he could improve on a Browning design. I'm pretty sure if Browning was around, if anybody was going to improve on one of his designs, he would he would appreciate a guy like that. You know, this guy had his this guy had his uh, he had his ducks in a row. That's for damn sure. He was a, a good engineer, and um, he designed um, a uh, a way of putting this shotgun together where you didn't have to worry about changing the friction rings in here if you remember in the a5 i'm not sure if i even showed that when i did the a5 but 
but I'm sure there's a million videos on it if you, on YouTube if you're interested to take a look. There's these friction rings that you, you swap them around. Actually, when you when you take the forehand off underneath, there's like a, a paper that shows you the orientation to put them in for light loads, medium loads, heavy loads, and you don't have to switch it around. Um, but I find that I find that the Remington, uh, that the, the A5 was very forgiving, you know what I mean? Um, you could probably own the thing for the life of the shotgun shooting all different kinds of shells and never have to swap anything. But if you religiously were using, like, really powerful, you know, slugs and stuff like that, that's, like, slamming the bolt against the back of the receiver, you could always make an adjustment. And, uh, you know, if you're using unusually light loads that you hand-loaded or something and they weren't fully cycling, you could switch it to, you know, this to make it lighter tension on the spring. But um, I've shot all different kinds of ammo out of it and never had to swap anything. So um, it is very forgiving. But this design, nothing had to be changed at all for, for the different loads. And um, it's interesting. There's a... See how this is... I think this is birch. These mohawks were all made in birch. Like Basically, in 68, they stopped production. But then just whatever parts were left over, they continued to make these ones for these, uh, you know, like these big box stores. Basically, it would be like how Walmart is today, how they have, you know, special models and everything. You know what I'm talking about. So, um, Birch. And inside of here, uh, very similar to the 1100. See, there's a lot... There's a lot here that carried through to the 1100, like this aluminum trigger guard and stuff like that. You can see there's, there's things that when you look at this, you're like, you're like, oh, the 1100 definitely borrowed from it. Or, uh, you know, I, I didn't look to see exactly when the 1100 was produced, but, but I'm pretty sure uh, this beats it. You know, like these pins in here like this to hold it together. And it does have its similarities. It's kind of like the 1100's uh, great-grandfather. And um, so there's there's like a fork here that presses a spring into the stock here that's like the this spring action here, just for the bolt. Because you see the barrel isn't moving, but the barrel is... See if I got enough strength to do this. See, the barrel is also spring-loaded. And uh, this is what's called long recoil operated. And you got to remember, there's a distinction that's important. It, it uh, bothers me when people they say, "Oh, yeah, the action recoils back as as large as the shell," whereas short recoil it reco it recoils back less than the length of the of the uh, round. But it's not. It actually long recoil. It actually the bolt will the bolt and the barrel will recoil together for a distance greater than the shell length okay so that's important it's definitely greater um that's what makes it work but um what we could do is let's uh let's go in here let's take this off this is very familiar to uh to you shot shotgun guys oops And uh, the wood comes off. You see, there's nothing in here. Um, but it is sleeved. It is sleeved here because it, it, it moves. The barrel moves. So that has to be sleeved. And, uh, yeah, and here it is. See, it sits, it sits here on this uh, spring. And this system right here supposedly adjusts for the different loads without it having to... Um, without it having to have anything changed around. Uh, exactly how that happens, I'm not sure. <laughs> but um, but this, if you look in here, you have to be sure when you put this together, sometimes you're used to just sliding this in and it goes like that, but there's, if you see inside of there, there's actually a kind of like a thread, you see that? Because it's very important that, see how this thread's in there like that? That's important that it goes all the way and give it like a little snug so it stays like right there. It doesn't uh, unscrew. That's important. Well, we're going to take this out now because with this out, let me get it out of the way. With this out, I'll be able to see these types of barrels. They look, 
they look a little odd when you see them. Well, first of all, this is kind of like slides inside rails to be able to slide back and forth. You imagine there has to be a point back here where it, where it slides back and forth in a rail. This is it. And then this is kind of interesting. When you see this kind of configuration, you're like, oh, that looks like a little odd how that's flared out. Why does that need to be that way? Well, I'm going to show you. This is pretty cool how these work. Um, so without the spring here, I'm better able to see how these fit inside a rail right there. And this whole barrel slides back and forth in here. Well, I'm going to show you. This is pretty much, that's pretty much where it sits. Right about there um, at rest when it's all put together. And uh, when it fires, this whole assembly together like this recoils all the way back like this. And then when it comes forward, the bolt stays. And the barrel comes forward. And the barrel will trip right now there's no round in there so i think it stays back on the last round but i don't want it to come forward because it's not put together and if it slaps forward like that or whatever it could damage something so i just want to do it under controlled conditions but once the barrel gets back into place if there's a shell here it will automatically close obviously because it's semi-automatic it'll close and pick up the next round so what we could do is, though, I could show you. Let's drop a snap cap in here and uh, close the close the bolt on it. So now it sits right there. And interesting, you could see the extractor sits in a groove. Here's the extractor right there, and the extractor has a groove, there's a groove in the barrel that the extractor fits in, so it, it's all flush, so the bolt is flush and holding the round. So now let's just say, let's say bang here, <laughs> okay? So let me just uh, maybe zoom in just a touch. So when the round goes off, this whole assembly. So you see how over here, see how the extractor sits inside a, a cut. So it has uh, it has that round gripped right up against the uh, it's the, uh, against the, the the breech face there. The barrel and the breech face stay together all the way back till we hit here. When we hit here, the bolt locks back. Whether there's a round ready to go or not, it will lock back. It doesn't come back forward with it. It comes back forward like this, and you say, well, wait a minute. It's leaving the shell behind. So how is it going to eject that? How is it going to eject that? Because there's nothing. Now the barrel's just going to come all the way forward. How is the bolt going to start coming forward? That's going to be in the way. But it isn't, because on the way back... See, it's hard to get it to eject out, but... You saw if it had enough energy to flip completely 180 degrees. On the way back, it's getting caught on here. You see that? So as it's as the barrel is returning, let's get over here again. Well, it's I think we have to start from scratch because. We have to get that under the extractor. Oops, sorry. Maybe something a little too much. So it locks back and on the way back. I'm gonna do it slow this time. That's the extra that's the ejector right there. See it? The ejector comes from behind. To catch on the far side of the shell and this the extractor works in conjunction with the ejector to uh to kick it out that's pretty cool right
<laughs> yeah, that is pretty cool. And then once it once it ejects it and it comes back into battery, it'll it'll uh, actuate the slide the, the the bolt stop there and release it to pick up the next round. So let's uh, look while I'm here. It's always important to keep that nice and lubricated. I mean, I'm in here already, so. Those rails right there are important. A little, a little battle still in there. Maintenance during the video. And not only that. Behind there. I got a feeling it's a shotgun that likes to be wet. So, um, how did I even learn about this thing? <laughs> to, like, want one of these? Because I actually did want one. Well... There was a buddy of mine. There is a buddy of mine. He, um, I went, uh, I went trap shooting with him. And, uh, he busts out a Mohawk 48. The thing was dogged. It looked like, uh, looked like this thing had, uh, been through a war. And he said that it was his grandfather's. And I was interested in it, and I thought it was an 1100, and then when I saw it, I was like, I was fascinated by the fact that it was um, long recoil. What does this say on here? It says something here. Let's get up close. This and forward toward muzzle for all loads see that so they just want to be clear because it definitely had something to do with swapping the bushing from one side to the other on the a5 so i mean they just wanted to make it clear to everybody um that does not need to be moved from front to back for any reason for all loads you understand what all loads means. So, I'm sorry, I might have to go out of frame here to put this together because you got to kind of stand it up on the front end. And, sorry, guys. You got to like uh, put a little pressure here to make sure it seats. So, my buddy. So, he, um, he busts this thing out and he shoots really well with it. It looked like he was shooting with his eyes closed. This guy's crazy. But um, he he does shoot good with it, and I'm looking at this thing and I'm fascinated because I had never even heard of it before. I'm like Mohawk, what the? Now um, I'm thinking Indians and everything, you know, because I'm hearing Mohawk. Um, it turns out that uh, Remington in Ilion, New York, is actually built on a river. Most of these big factories like that were built on rivers so that supplies could be brought in and their product that they made could be brought it out brought out um back when Remington first uh became a company. You know, trucking was around, you know what I mean? Everything was brought on horses. You didn't have like eight hundred horses pulling a uh a semi track that you know, a, a tra like a trailer or whatever. It was um Basically, horses were just really used just for people transportation, and you could have like a stagecoach with some stuff on it. But real movement of product was rail and um, shipping. Um, so um, you'd see a lot of these factories, a lot of these things would be built on waterways. And that river that Remington is built on is the Mohawk River. So that's where that name must come from. That's why they. They use that name, you know what I mean? It has to be. I really don't think it's a coincidence. They just happen to be thinking about weird types of Indian hairstyles. Um, so, yeah, let's load this thing up with some snap caps and uh, show you how it well, Those rare, I got a, a tub of rare earth magnets to do something with it. I was going to make, like, something to hold my cell phone on the dash and... I, I can't believe how strong those magnets are there. You have to be careful with them. Like you can get hurt if it if it snaps onto something and your finger's in the way. Uh, it takes four. 
second chamber one of these snap caps to put another one in there to make a five full a full uh full boat there so um so my buddy so i i uh i always kind of like this Mohawk 48 every time we went to shoot i was always like there's that thing again there's that there's that that mohawk mohawk 48 what the hell and his might be one that's from somewhere in the 50s or something you know what i mean it was all it was old it was there well no i'm not really see now did they start making these mohawk ones later on see that's this is where the history of it gets weird because it is a mohawk it's not an 1148 so i think i think from what i read they started making these mohawk ones yeah maybe somewhere in the in the in the late 50s and they were the ones that they supplied to the stores and then when remington stopped making them they didn't produce anymore but the parts that they had left they kept supplying these stores and that's how they used up like the last of their parts so they were still doing barrel dating and everything even way back then and this barrel date this is an ax barrel date which is march of 73 is what i'm coming up with uh 20 28 inch long barrel uh and these uh these mohawks i did find some information that said they were produced from 70 to 75 so i guess it's possible that my buddy had uh had one that, and it was from the 70s and it was his grandfather beat it up in the 70s that's entirely possible but um i just i just don't know I just don't know. So this is, uh, yeah, and it's and it's in birch. So that's interesting that they'd be, uh, you know, if you're into like birch wood, these are uh, nice to go with there. But what happened there? Did I put it back together uh, with an issue? <laughs> what happened there? I I extol on its virtues, and then it. Uh, Kind of wants to be down there. Hmm. I don't know what happened there. Not picking up the rounds. Let's uh, let's find out what's going on here. It's sitting right there. Should be popping it out. Hmm. Let's uh, load it one more time and then I'm going to take it apart and put it back together again because sometimes, even just the way it uh, cannot load it with the uh, bolt open, apparently. Also, these snap caps, these are not from realisticsnapcaps.com. He doesn't make um, shotgun shells that I know of. So I'm stuck with an inferior product. So, uh, but I would certainly use his if he made them. some kind of problems picking up that round. I'm taking it apart and putting it back together again. Always do that if something's not working right after you first take it apart. I know it doesn't seem like that could have had anything to do with it, but trust me. Yeah, we have the uh, it's in there properly. Why can't we get the bolt to stay back now? Oh, now the bolt's just locked there. That's that's good. Hmm. I don't know what's going on. Now it just now it locked. Now I have to push the shell forward just to 
just to close the action. How am I going to do that? This isn't pointy enough. Never had this issue with it before. This is not that, you know, I have a tremendous amount of good experience with it, but we're going to have, I need a bunch of hands here to push this in and that back. Nope, not in time. Oh, that shell, now that shell popped out and went behind the lifter. You see that? When that happens, that usually means you have to take the magazine, uh, you have to take the whole magazine spring out and, and, the, and the, you know, that clip at the top of the magazine housing, which is always a pain in the ass. That's what happened. Oh, okay, good. So at least I get the bolt back now so I can pick it up. Get that out. Whoa! <laughs> like your fingers much? We gotta just do that one more time. Taking it apart with rounds in the magazine tube was not a good idea. That's, I have to push this into the tube. Open that, then that could come back. Oh, I lost it. Oh, F my life. I just wanted to do a video. Get out of there. Oh, it's still, no, it's out. It's out. What are you doing? Get out. Oh, my God. Okay. What's this? Is there some kind of debris, foreign substance in here? What is that? Okay. I'm glad you're here, people. I'm glad you're here. Nobody would believe what I got to go through. And what's going on over here? I was messing around with the barrel out. I mean, with that spring out, messing around with the barrel. There's a chance that something got hooked. You gotta be careful it's fooling around with your finger in here like that. You saw how that slammed shut. That would not feel good, you know? Let me see in here. Good. See, this, uh, this is what I don't like here. I don't like that this... I don't like that there's movement here. I'm not so sure there's supposed to be this kind of movement. Why is that moving? Okay, let's uh, let's just put it together again. Tighten that, like I said. That's what I said. I said to tighten it. That's what I said. Let's uh, get a little hair of the dog. <laughs> Oil up that front. Lift through a little bit. There we go. Oop. <laughs> it's like the spring omatic shotgun. A lot of springs going on. Well, you know what? Those springs do a lot, man. They mitigate that recoil. This thing is a very smooth shooter, you know? Sorry, but once again, I just got to come up out of frame for just a second. Just so I can push that down. Screw this in. Detent ball. There we go. Also, you know what? When you... A lot of times, the shotgun's not made to be sideways. You know what I mean? And um, you always got to remember, too, the, the amount of force when you're firing these things and how it's operating. It's not really made to cycle this way. It's not. You see how I'm showing you how it cycles with the barrel coming back and everything like that. So obviously, this would just be like a way to unload it or something. You know, you know what I'm saying. This isn't really indicative of how it actually works um, when it's when it's actually firing. You know what I mean? Because it, it's it's not just doing this, not just reciprocating the bolt to eject the rounds. 
um, ejecting the rounds this way is is secondary. See, like that that ejector sits there. You see, so when the whole barrel moves and it comes forward, it ejects, or it does double duty. It will eject this way. But the fact that the rounds aren't popping out of this magazine tube is, uh, I'm sure if, if, I, if everything was functioning properly and the barrel was reciprocating properly, it would be, this mechanism would be working. But let's, um, before I do any more damage control, and you know what, I don't, I don't know, I don't trust these snap caps. That's why... They're plasticky, and if I'm not using realistic snap caps, I always have a problem. That's why I always have a problem with those plastic garbage. I hate to, like, I don't want to always sound like I'm doing a commercial, but, man, see, these are these are aluminum, so they're a little bit better, but I think. Let's see, but these got all chewed up, too, through the years, and when they get, when these get chewed up, they don't uh, function as they should. Pick that up. No problem there. It didn't, for some reason, the extractor didn't catch it, but yeah, the extractor's not catching it because the rim of it is, is dogged. That's the reason why. Chamber it again. Get out. I don't want you either. Chunks of freaking aluminum in my action. A few more. I think these are the least beat up ones I have, but. They're beat up nonetheless. I'm not chambering shotgun shots in here, so. But I'll tell you right now, I, I've been trap shooting with this thing. And uh, you know what I do sometimes? Like, even though I'm just doing regular trap, not skeet, I'll surreptitiously load five rounds. Like, as I'm waiting to shoot again, I slip four in there when no one's like, kind of like surreptitiously, no one's looking. And uh, just so that I could test out a shotgun like this. It only takes four in the tube, so I'll load one, shoot it, and then as it's going back around and everyone else is taking their shot, I'll slip four in there instead of just slipping one more. And uh, and then cycle the action this way, and I'll fire. You know, the guy calling it never really notices, or if he does, he just doesn't care. It just, two just came out, if you could see that. I'm not even going to let go of the bolt here because... That's going to cause a catastrophe. I'm just going to try to figure out what to do. There's nothing that could be done. <laughs> I got to just let go. Or maybe if I could just push it back, the bolt. Push it back in the tube. Nope. Oh, the bolt's locked open now. So let's see if I... No, I can't unlock it. Now I might be screwed into having to... Take the magazine tube off. The, the spring and everything out. Yeah, it's not it's not like in these snap caps. I'm not even using these things anymore. That's it. No more cycling uh no more cycling snap caps. That's it. It's the end of it. And wood, remember, see I just went right across here. I don't know if you can see that, but it made a line. But it's wood. You just wipe that right off. If this was like some kind of like anything that was even made out of even the softest metal. No, no, no. Watch your finger. Wow, even another one's coming right behind it. Like that, it's not even stopping anything from coming out now. All right, that's it. I got two. So if I got number two, number three, I could just cycle out normally. Oh, that's number two. Get out. Get out. Get out of my gun. Heathen. one all right oh that's it these ones are garbage they're just all chewed up that's what it is and and this shotgun is like new it really is it's it's uh it's from 73 i'm telling you this thing is beautiful so the end of the story with uh why i got one of these was that um i walked into a gun store it's a place that i frequent all the time and i was like what the it can't be and i picked it up and I saw Mohawk 48, 48, excuse me. And uh, my buddy there that owns the place was like, ah, you don't want that. It's a piece of junk. <laughs> That's what he said. He goes, oh, that's a piece of junk. Look at this. Look at this M1 carbine I got in, though. And I'm like, 
No, nah, but this is uh, this is interesting, kind of. You know, I wanted to play it off. I was like, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a piece of junk. Ugh, no one's going to buy this. Let me take it off your hands for you. What do you want for it? I, mean, I might have got this thing for like 150 bucks or something, honestly. And it's just, uh, it's just in such beautiful shape. So you know what? I would have thought forever that it was just a piece of junk that wasn't really worth my while. Unless uh, a buddy had one that was his grandfather's that he uh, basically shot with his eyes closed and couldn't miss a clay. And uh, it just got me interested where I saw it was long recoil. I probably would never have noticed that if somebody just called it junk in a gun store. I would have just breezed right over it. And uh, instead, I learned something new um, from my buddy and uh, waited patiently. And I knew that one would come that would be mine. And now uh, there it is. And I'm not even sure if this thing was fired when I um, when I first uh, picked it up and took it to the range. I mean, it's sharp. It's definitely sharp. And uh, don't, don't let all of that uh, don't all, don't let all of that uh, make it look bad. Honestly, I mean, I know when uh, very people can be critical. Sometimes they see something that doesn't seem like it's functioning properly, or that it's really. I'm telling you that this thing is the top. It's just uh, it's just these chewed up snap caps. And, um, and that this isn't really the way it's supposed to function. It's very difficult to really make it function the way it's supposed to. It's not, uh, it's, it's not easy to push, to just to, to do this. Like if I put one hand here and my other hand here and I try to push it together, it's as far as I can get. If I get some momentum, maybe that's it. That's it. So you can't even, you can't even uh, cycle these. And I'm not... And I'm not talking the hammer. The hammer's cocked already. You know what I mean? Like if I pulled the trigger, now it would be even worse because now it has to cock the hammer. See? So don't forget it. It would never happen. It's like an exercise. You can do it. You got to get like a bodybuilder in. Like move over. I will show you how to do it. And the guy's like, Bruh. that would be great. Obviously, I need some rest. It's been a long week. It's been a long three weeks. I've been promising you guys videos, and uh, I apologize. I've really been slacking, but this is good because I'm not short on material. Um, I got the brick to show you. Remember what the brick was? The brick was what I got at the gun show, and uh, I've affectionately, I've affection, I've given it the affectionate title. I've affect, it's now affectionately known as the brick. And then uh, I also picked something else up that just opened my eyes to a completely um, new gun that I never even knew about. So I know your ears are perking up at that one, but uh, it's true. Um, not to say it's not like the most hidden thing. Um, when I show it, people will be like, oh, what are you talking about? I knew about those, you know, but it's, uh, it's a little obscure, but it's one of those things that always just seem to slip through the cracks for me. And I got one and I'm showing you and it's from 1908 so we'll uh for people who think that this isn't old enough for a milsurp channel and this is milsurp these things were used let me see i got a page open here i can tell you right now i think it's korea small numbers were purchased by soldiers for use in korea also small numbers were again purchased by soldiers and fielded in vietnam by the united states marine corps there you go so this is a milsurp uh, gun so don't give me any don't give me any slack so that's it. We're uh, we're out. Um, I am being systematically demonetized for absolutely no reason, and uh, and I love it. So it's really no big deal. I hang in there, and the, the demonetization is great because then you guys don't have to watch ads. I suppose I don't think they put ads on the demonetized videos, but I mean they're demonetizing me for like showing how a Colt revolver locks up when you squeeze the trigger. I'm not doing any modification. I'm not doing... I mean, it's, it's weird. It's wild. Why are they demonetizing that? I don't know. But uh, we'll be back soon with uh, some interesting stuff. See you all later. Thanks.